Um, hope everybody's doing well. Um, all right, for today is to kind of wrap up this last bit that we didn't get to last time on uh, continuous random variables, which is I'm um, talking about exponential distribution situations where that would be applicable and how we can calculate probabilities um, for exponential distributions. And then we'll take a look at um, joint distributions that you guys did some reading about before class today. Um, so in the meantime, you guys don't forget, you've got a homework assignment that is due on Monday. Um, it's, you know, it's a bit longer, so just be sure you don't wait until Sunday evening to do it. Um, there's one problem on that assignment that's going to require you to do some work with um, exponential distributions, but the rest of it we've, we've gotten through already. Um, before we get going, and any questions about anything? Uh, okay, so I just want to wish a happy new year, Chinese new year to um, everybody, particularly students in China. Um, if you're not here, it's like, I think 4 a.m. in China by my math, so that's understandable, but um, I hope you're celebrating um, regardless. And okay, so let's celebrate by talking about exponential distributions. Um, okay, so let's see, let me get this out of the way. So situations where um, these exponential functions would come in handy would be um, something like what's going on in, in question eight. So let's say for example, um, you're waiting for the next train uh, at Union Station and you're thinking about, well, how long am I gonna wait for the train? So we can say like, let's let X be amount of time that you wait for the train. And if we think about what this distribution might look like, first of all, it's, it's a time here. So it's gonna be something positive, starting at zero, presumably going off to infinity, I guess. If you're unlucky, you could be stuck waiting for five days for the light rail or even longer, um, but that's not very likely. So those probabilities will basically be zero. But if you think about what happens, you know, maybe you get lucky and the train comes right when you get there. Um, as time goes on, it's going to be less and less likely to wait one minute, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, because if you've waited one minute, that means um, by definition, you've already wait, waited longer than this time, right? So as time goes on, it's kind of given that you've already waited one minute, so it's going to be less likely that the train comes in two minutes. And it's going to be even less likely that it comes in three minutes and so on. So as time goes on, um, it's going to flatten out since it's less and less likely that you're waiting an hour, two hours, three hours. And so situations like this, where um, say something like at x equals zero is the most likely scenario. And then as x increases, the probability density function decreases. So as time goes on, it's gonna be less and less likely that you have to wait that long. Um, and so situations like this are modeled with what's called um, an exponential distribution because as you can see, these graphs are like decre the decaying exponential function. So we wouldn't wanna use uh, distribution like this. It doesn't follow a normal distribution. Um, it, it follows a totally different distribution. So the way we calculate probabilities is going to be different. So kind of the main continuous distributions we've looked at, um, we have the uniform distribution. We worked a lot last time with the normal distribution. Um, less common, but still um, comes up quite a bit would be the exponential distribution. And um, this function the PDF is given by this. And we've got one parameter for this distribution, which is this um, parameter lambda. And so what we're going to need to identify in order to describe this distribution 
would be what's the average value of x? And then once I figure out that, then this parameter lambda is going to be one over that value. So we do have a function which we can integrate. Um, so that wasn't the case with the normal distribution. So we can calculate areas underneath this distribution by calculating definite integrals. Um, we can also use R to calculate them. So we can talk about how we do both of those things. Um, and then these formulas are quite uh, nice for the variance and the expected value. So um, this kind of exhausts the main distributions that we're going to be looking at. So I think a good exercise for you would be to kind of list out what are all the distributions we've seen, binomial, geometric, Poisson, et cetera. And then for each of them, write out what's the formula for the PDF, what's the shortcut for the expected value and the variance, how could I calculate this in R? I think those would be um, useful kind of sheet to have uh, for reference. Any, any questions before we take a look at example? Okay, so yeah, so here's a situation where we can use an exponential distribution. And again, these are gonna be situations where, we're, where we know like the average amount of time it takes to wait for something. And as time goes on, it gets less and less likely that you're gonna have to wait that long. So something like calls coming into a 911 center um, would be something that follows an exponential distribution. And so in this example, what we need to identify is mu, and then we can identify what lambda is. So this is saying we, we're getting one call every two minutes. So here we're going to let um, x is denoting the time that elapses from one call to the next, right? And we're told that this is two minutes. So that means that lambda would be one half then. It's the reciprocal of that. So then this exponential function, just plugging this in for the lambda over here, we would get uh, one half e to the minus one half x. Maybe I'll write it like this. And since we're dealing with wait times, we have no upper limit for that, um, but at least it can't be a negative time. So any questions about really how we identify what this one parameter uh, lambda is in this model? And so we would describe this as saying x follows the exponential distribution with lambda value equals one half. So the convention is to use lambda and not mu. Okay, any questions? Whoops, that was not what I wanted to do. I want some space just to sketch a graph of this. Okay, so uh, function is going to start off at one half here. It's not that important to know what this is, but right, if we plugged in zero, we would get one half. And what's important is that as x goes to infinity, this is decaying to zero. Okay, so um, now we can calculate probabilities from this distribution. So if we want to know um, what is the probability that it takes more than three minutes for the next train to come, 
or sorry, we're looking at 911 calls for the next call to come into the 911, we would want to calculate all of the area above three, right? So this would be the probability that X is bigger than or equal to three. Well, this says technically more. Um, and again, one thing with continuous distributions, right, it really doesn't matter whether we include or exclude that endpoint because the odds of you waiting exactly three minutes is zero, right? If you had a infinitely accurate measuring device, it would be like three minutes and one tenth of a second or something like that. So uh, just wanted to throw in that comment. And so we could calculate this by evaluating this integral. It's an improper integral. So technically, um, when we evaluate improper integrals, we would take the limit as that upper limit of the integral goes to zero. So we're kind of thinking about a definite integral and then what happens to that as n goes out to infinity. We can also use R to calculate these probabilities. So, um, you know, you're welcome to set up and do these integrals. It's definitely not bad practice to get into that. Um, but if we want to calculate this probability, there is a function built into R that can calculate these. So this is going to tell us the probability that random variable X is less than X. So we, this calculates area to the left. So if we want to calculate the probability that x is bigger than 3, what we can do right, would be subtract the probability that x is less than or equal to 3 from 1. So we can calculate this area over there and then use the fact that the total area should be one. So if I subtract the question mark from one, that's gonna give me exactly all this leftover stuff. Um, and so, I can, if you don't believe me that this works, I can show you, um, I've got R open someplace. Um, is in this case, we could do like one minus px. And then this tells us that the first thing we enter um, is, well, it's a little bit weird here, it's q. So the q would be the value of x, which is three. And the next thing that we enter is what they call the rate, which is lambda. So in this case, that would be one half. That comes out to about 22%. So we'll, we'll go with kind of the rule that we'll, we'll take things out to four decimal places. And you can check that if you actually evaluated that integral, you should get something pretty similar to that or something exactly like that. Any, any questions? Uh, okay, so if we want to go ahead and find the CDF for this distribution, what can we do? Find the antiderivative. Yeah, so. So integrate that function. Yeah, sorry, I realized I wasn't sharing this before. Yeah, so that 22% that would be this area over here. Um, yeah, so if we want to calculate the CDF, we use the fact that this is equal to the integral of the PDF. 
And so we start that integral at the minimum value, which in this case is zero. And then in the end, we're gonna get a function of X. So the important thing here is we want to use x as the upper limit because this is going to be the variable in our CDF. We're going to think about what happens as we have different values for the upper cutoff. So with that in mind, we don't want to use the same variable inside the integral. So if you were wondering um, why I put a T over there, it's just because I want to pick another letter other than X, okay? You could pick any other letter, really. So yeah, so here we could um, integrate. Whoops, that's exactly why I didn't want that there. Um, so we have a T over here, PT. And so we can integrate this. Um, I'll save, I'll try to do this quickly. So the minus one, we would, we would get a minus two that comes out using substitution here if you're keeping track. And then evaluating at the endpoints would give us um, a minus e to the minus x over two minus, and when I plug in zero, I would get minus one here. Now we've got a formula in terms of X for the cumulative distribution function. And just remember, this tells us the probability that X is at most lowercase x. So um, here we should just specify that there is a range or a domain here. Which is if X is less than zero, then there's no probability of this happening. Otherwise, there's no upper limit as X goes to infinity. The cumulative distribution is one minus E to the minus X over two. So when we want, when we know the PDF and we want to calculate the CDF, we integrate. And let me just say, um, in some cases, that is sometimes we know the cumulative distribution and we might want to follow, find the probability density function. And so if starting from here to get to the cumulative distribution we integrate, what do you think would be a good operation if we know what this is to try and figure out what lowercase f is? It's derivative. Yeah, so we, we would do the opposite, the inverse operation of integrate, which in this case, whoops, that's not right. We would take the derivative of this. And in fact, that's something that you have to do on this homework assignment for Monday um, to figure out what that is. So we integrate the PDF to find the CDF. We differentiate the CDF to get the PDF. We can go in either direction. Um, okay, and then you could use this to find the median and, and do other calculations with this. Um, sometimes it's useful to find the inverse of the cumulative distribution function because we can use that to find percentiles. So we say like 99 um, percentile would be the value of X. So just to kind of look ahead to what this question is asking, Right. It's trying to find the value of X so that 99% of all calls 
um, occur less than that much time. And so if you wanted to set that up with the CDF, or excuse me, with the PDF, then we would need to solve some sort of equation like this. Percent. Sorry? Shouldn't that be 90%? Oh, that says 90, not 99. Yes, thank you. OK, cool. Yeah. I misread my own question. And I need my DX there. Yeah. And so um, we've already done the integration part. So it's usually much easier to identify these values from the cumulative distribution function from this one over here. So instead, we can think about Solving that, which is a bit easier, right? Because that's an algebraic equation as opposed to some integral that we need to evaluate and then solve an algebraic equation. And so if we wanted to identify the 90%, then we could solve this. If I wanted to find the 99th percentile or the 80th percentile, then we could keep solving these equations all over again. Um, if we find the general formula for the inverse of the CDF, then we can kind of plug in any percentile that we want and figure out what the corresponding x value is. Um, so that's why it is useful sometimes to kind of think about the inverse of this. So I'll call that, um, I'll use a, maybe p is a bad letter here. I'll use a q for um, quantile. And so we want to find the inverse of this function. So in other words, we would like to solve this for q. So what would be some reasonable operations to try if we want to solve this for x? First, take the natural log. Uh, yeah, so we're definitely going to want to invert, to take the inverse of this exponential. Um, by doing a natural log at some point. I think it might be nice to bring that constant over to the other side before we, we do the um, natural log. So we just have the exponent isolated. So if I subtract one from both sides, we get this. That negative sign is mildly annoying. So right, that's equivalent to that. And now we can take um, natural log of both sides. And what's nice about that is on this side, right, they are inverses, so they're going to undo each other. And so this finally tells us that this inverse function Um, solving that for x, we multiply both sides by minus 2. And um, the kind of useful thing about this is now if I wanted to answer this question, I plug in the quantile, right, the, the area, which is 0.9. So rather than solve an equation, it becomes evaluate an equation. And um, you might be thinking, why, why do we have a negative sign there? Are we going to get a negative value for x? Um, when I take the natural log of this, it's going to be something negative. And then I multiply it by negative 2, and it becomes um, positive. Uh, let's see. That comes out to approximately about 4.6 minutes. Um, are there any questions? That's the first time we've um, inverted one of those CDFs. So I um, hope that 
process of finding the inverse makes sense, the algebra there, as well as like what you would do with that function. Okay, um, I will kind of hop over F. Um, I'll put the solutions up for that if you want to practice this one. Um, but I want to kind of move on into um, take a look at some of the joint distribution um, problems. So uh, this is the next worksheet, worksheet five. And so now we're going to kind of take a look at the first couple of sections in chapter four. Um, a lot of that stuff in chapter four, um, we're not going to talk about because we're not going to need those sort of probability concepts. Um, but if you've taken math 4810 or you're going to take math 4810, you'll, you'll jump into that stuff a bit more. So math 4810 is our probability course. Um, okay, so here's kind of the um, reading quiz or the video that I made and then the, the corresponding reading quiz that went along with this. Um, were there any, any questions about that material? Um, it's just a two-way table, right? Nothing fancier than that, other than the fact that rather than give the table in terms of counts, how many things, how many out of this many people are following these different groups, we just describe things in terms of proportions. So we have a joint, um, in this case, probability mass function, which tells us how likely something is based on two random variables, variables in this case, but it could be more than two. Um, and from that joint distribution, we can then um, sum over one of the variables to, to get what's called a marginal probability distribution, which then tells us really the um, PMF for the random variable X. So we can also kind of isolate each of those variables and think about the probability distribution of X, probability distribution of Y, and then the joint probability of X and Y. Okay, yeah, so the quiz results look, look pretty good. Um, and so with the continuous random variable, similar ideas, except now we're gonna, rather than sum things up, we're gonna have to integrate things. But we use the same terminology. So we say joint, and now it's a joint PDF. So it's a probability density function. And we can find the marginal density functions by integrating this function of two variables with respect to just one of them. So I do want to go through these integrals because, um, yeah, they're going to involve a couple of variables and we just want to be sure we're approaching them the right way. We are going to do some double integrals today as well. So um, I did put up some materials in Canvas. If it's been a while since you've done double integrals, you might want to check that out. Uh, we're not going to do any um, triple integrals, so um, don't worry about that. Okay, right, so the um, scenario I want to take a look at is we have a pharmacy and they have a drive up window and a walk up window and um, X and Y are denoting what proportion of the time are each of these windows in use. So uh, X is den denoting the, the proportion of time that drive up window is in use, Y the walk-up window. And each of these are proportions, and so that's why their values are between 0 and 1. So um, x being 0 would tell us that the drive-up window was never in use that day. x being 1 would tell us the drive-up window was in use the entire day. And so one thing I might be interested in considering is um, like, what's the probability that the drive up window is in use 50% of the day or something like this. So if I just want to think about how often is the drive up window being used regardless of what's going on with the walk up window, that's where we would use what's called um, the marginal distribution for X. And so to calculate this, we're 
are going to take this joint PDF. and integrate it over y. So after I'm done with this process, there shouldn't be any y's left in my expression. And I'm going to integrate over the entire range of values that y could be. So that, that might be some infinities. Um, usually, we have a kind of um, finite interval. And so now when I'm integrating this, just to be really clear here, right? Our variable is y. So we're going to treat x just like it were a number. So we can, I can bring out the six fifths. That's not a big deal. And so what would I get when I integrate x with respect to y? x plus 1 x y. Yeah, so we treat x just like oh, x y. Yeah. So like it, it would, we would treat it the same way as if we were integrating this, right? So this would tell me like this over here is 3y and right, we have a plus c or something like that. Um, so we treat it just the same way. So I could have pulled this x out as well. So x is constant. So when I integrate a constant, I get whatever that constant is times y. And now when I'm integrating y squared, right, we would do that as our usual power rule, for example, on that one. And then it might be useful to actually indicate what are you substituting these values in for? So you don't want to make the mistake of plugging them in for x, right? So these are values for y. So plugging in one, what we would get here? We get six uh, fifths times, on one hand, we would get uh, y. Oh, I did that mistake, right? So we're going to plug one in for y. So we get x plus one third. And then we're going to subtract what we get when we plug in zero, which is zero in that case. And so if I simplify that, I think I get six fifths x minus two fifths. And um, a good check would be make sure at this point your variable is x and you, you shouldn't have any y's. So we're going to get um, this function as long as x is between 0 and 1, and we're going to get 0 otherwise. Uh, any questions? Okay. Um, so then if we want to answer questions like this, so this is saying, um, what is the probability that X, which is the drive up window is in use like less than one quarter of the time. So that's what that is calculating. And so when we have questions that are asking us to calculate how likely is it that X has certain values and we have no restriction on Y at all, this is where these marginal distribution functions would come in handy. 
So we would cheat this just like any other um, probability question if we know what the PDF is. So that function was 6 fifths x minus 2 fifths. Uh, yeah, there's a question. Sorry, I missed that. Um, Stephanie. Um, for that, shouldn't it be plus 2 fifths? Or am I missing something? Mm, I don't think you're missing something. No, you're right. OK, thank yeah. you. Yeah, that was a plus over here. So that should be a plus over here. Thanks. Big uh, mistake up there. Um, and I'll save the integration for you guys to um, check, but this should come out to uh, 11 8 over 80. You better not get a number which is like bigger than one here, right? Or else you made a mistake. Keep in mind, these are calculating um, probabilities. So make sure your, your answer seems to make practical sense since as you can see, it's really easy to make a minus sign or a plus sign into something that it's not. So when you make those mistakes, typically you get answers that don't make sense. Um, and that means you should go back and just make sure you didn't miss something in, in your work. Uh, okay, are there any questions? Okay, I'll, I'll kind of leave this for practice since this is mostly an integration problem. But just keep in mind here, you're still gonna integrate the same function, the, the um, joint PDF, just now you're going to integrate this with respect to x. So that means um, we're using, oops, that we're going to use um, these values for x over here. And now our variable is x and we would treat the y squared as a constant, um, but it follows pretty similarly. So we're using those x values. Okay, um, then kind of the last thing to, maybe not the last thing, is there more? Nope, last thing to consider for this is, how do we calculate probabilities where we're now thinking about, this is really an and probability. Like what is the probability that the walk-up window, or excuse me, the drive-up window is in use less than one quarter of the time, and the walk-up window is in use less than half the time. Let me just say, um, if you did give this one a shot, uh, it should come out to 3 fifths plus 6 fifths y squared. And so when we want to calculate probabilities for both of these, right, in the end, we shouldn't get any function. We should get a number. So in that case, we're going to integrate the joint distribution over the corresponding values for these two random variables. So in general, I'm just going to use like an A and a B and a C and a D. So in general, it would look like that. And um, with double integrals, right, you have some freedom to interchange the order that you integrate. So that might make a difference when you're working on these. 
But in this case, um, we would want to integrate as y goes from zero to one half, as x goes from zero to one fourth, six fifths um, times x plus y squared. And you want to make sure that these values The y's right should match up with the outer limits, and then you want to make sure that the x matches up with the inner limits. Um, yep, but then you've got a double integral to evaluate there. Um, again, I will kind of mostly use this time to set up the integrals um, and kind of leave the actual calculus part um, for you guys to kind of check at home. There are no functions built into R that are going to be able to handle like something like this. Since this doesn't follow a well-known distribution, then we have to just do the integration. Um, so when you're doing your work, you don't have any double integrals on this assignment. This will be on next week's assignment. Um, I do want to see how you set up your integral and how you evaluate it. So show me the steps about um, how you evaluate those. In situations where you're using R and not doing the integral, then you just need to show me what the R code was that, that you used and you don't need to write out the integral. Okay, any, any questions? Okay, so we do need to be careful here. Um, what I don't want to do is calculate each of these probabilities, this probability, and then this probability separate from each other, um, and then just multiply the two of them together, right? We can only kind of do that sort of thing when events are independent. Um, so yeah, sorry, here's kind of the general gist for um, what we just stated in the previous problem, which is um, if you want to calculate probabilities that x is between certain values and y is between certain values, then you've got a double integral to evaluate. Okay, so um, returning back to this notion of independence of events, we said that two events were independent if the probability that they both occur is equal to the probability that the first event occurs times the probability that the second event occurs. Um, so in general, it's not this simple. We need to kind of do, we need to consider how both of those variables affect each other. Um, but when we're in certain situations where we know that the two variables are independent, then we could possibly use this. Um, we could just deal with each of the marginal distributions and then take the product. So um, this is how we can check to see whether distributions are independent or not. So we should kind of assume by default that they're not independent. And so let me come back to the insurance example. And um, here were the two marginal distributions that we found. And um, for the pharmacy example, we had uh, two marginal distributions.
And so the question is, in each of these examples, you know, is um, A independent of H? Okay, so what this is saying is, okay, does the auto deductible that somebody chooses have any effect on what they choose for their deductible for their home insurance policy? And over here, we're asking, okay, are these two things independent? Is the time, that, is the proportion of time that one of the windows open, does that have any effect on the proportion of time that the other window is in use? And so in order to check these, you can kind of use this property that And so if these, if this equation is equal, in other words, the product of the two marginal distributions does indeed give me the joint distribution, Okay, and if they aren't equal for all values of X and Y, then we would say they're not independent. Okay, so, um, Yeah, so maybe this is something good to open up some breakout rooms and just have you guys um, talk about this. So um, I'd like you to think about, start maybe thinking about five. This actually might be a little bit easier to check. And then based on what you do down here, um, see if you can figure out whether you think A and H are independent. So I think it might be useful to think in practical terms since these variables are representing tangible things whether you would expect them to be independent and then see if the kind of mathematics supports that um, intuition. Um, any, any questions? You guys have something to work on when you go into breakout rooms? Uh, okay, so let's see, I will Set up some rooms. Okay, so the rooms are open and um, you and I will kind of come in to check on you guys and see if you have any questions or see if you're moving in the right direction. Um, all right, well, welcome back everyone. Um, so at least the, the groups that I checked in with, um, that was nice, um, nice work. It seemed like you guys were picking up on the gist of it, but um, please let me know what what questions might have come up um, that I missed. So yeah, to, to check these, um, we're trying to see, right, whether the product of the two marginal distributions equals the joint distribution for all of our values of the random variable. So here's the situation where it's actually easier to deal with the continuous case um, since um, we can describe these probabilities with functions. So I have the joint distribution up here we found these marginal distributions um, in an earlier problem. And so then you can think about, well, if I multiply, although they seem different, you wanna make sure that is this expression equivalent to this one. Um, and so once you distribute this out, you'll, you'll quickly see that there's no way to make this look exactly the same as that. It might work for some values of X and Y. For example, when X and Y are both zero, this product works, but it needs to work for all possible values of X and Y. Actually, I totally lied. It doesn't even work for zero. Um, and then for the discrete one, um, here it's a little bit trickier because we don't have like continuous functions. We have just kind of discrete 
values here. So what you would want to do is do a similar check, which is we want to check this, but we need to do this for all possible pairs of A and H. And so for this example, you would technically need to check all six table entries. So if it's going to be independent, it needs to be true for all six of those entries. So once you find one entry where this test fails, then these variables are going to be dependent. Um, so looking at like the very first entry in the table, that was 0.2. Um, so this was what one of the groups um, picked out. And then we can check with another one. And this one over here would give us like 0 0.1. To five, and then we see that they're not equal to each other. So these two variables would also be dependent. Um, the nice thing is most of our examples in statistics, we're going to be dealing with um, repeating random events and each repetition is going to be is going to be independent of the previous one. So we'll be able to use some nice properties um, when things are independent. But um, you don't want to use those special cases until you've checked things like this to make sure that your random variables are um, independent. Um, and it, hopefully, this this like makes some practical sense that um, you know if the Thinking about this example with, you know, what proportion of time is the pharmacy's walk-up window versus the drive-up window in use makes sense that they wouldn't be independent because if I show up at the pharmacy and I see 10 cars waiting for the drive-up window, I'm probably just going to go inside and, and try and deal with it that way or vice versa. Um, so it makes sense that we wouldn't expect those to be independent. And as far as like the auto and homeowners insurance as well, um, people that pick a higher deductible for the auto are probably more likely to pick a higher deductible for their homeowner's insurance. So um, there is some correlation between why did I choose this auto insurance policy and why did I choose this homeowner's policy. Um, any, any questions about um, four or five? Okay, great. So, um, Next thing to consider, or at least where we're um, heading towards is, well, how could we calculate um, like something like the expected value for um, a joint distribution? So um, we'll use this kind of rule over here, which is called the law of unconscious statistician, um, which basically says um, if I have a function of more than one variable, then what we can do is just take the expected value of that times the joint probability distribution. And um, these integrals are going to refer, the limits of the integrals would be the maximum minimum values of random variables x and y. Um, and similar definition, if we have discrete random variables, just instead of integrating, we have like tons, uh, we would need to sum up a bunch of things. So let's, let's see how one of these goes. Um, and then we can think about how we can, um, you know, calculate the um, expected value for, for functions of these random variables. So um, here we're going to consider random variable X and Y, which correspond to um, two separate rolls of a dime. And so this is a case where these are independent events. We're going to assume the die is fair. What you get on one roll has no effect on what you get on the other roll. And um, what we want to calculate is what is the expected value of the product of the um, numbers that we get on each die. So in this case, um, what would be the probability that we get either a one, two, three, four, five, or six. Uh, one, six. Yeah, that's right. So we can 
take it for granted here that this is a uniform distribution, right? The probability of getting a one or two or three, any one of those outcomes um, is the same. I lost my chat window. Where'd that go? Ah, okay, yes, <laughs> one six. Um, yeah, and then we're gonna get zero um, otherwise. There's no way you can get any other number. And the same goes for f of y. So what's important here is these are both um, discrete. And um, if we want to calculate the expected value of this function, which is the product, uh, sorry, we have um, discrete random variables. So um, this law of the unconscious statistician says, okay, we're gonna just, usually when we calculate expected values, we just plug in the function inside the integral or inside the sum. And we're gonna do the same, no matter what that function looks like. So um, what would this f of x, y um, look like in this case? Like I've got my formula for the marginal distribution for X. I have my formula for the marginal distribution of Y. This expected value is gonna require me to know what the joint distribution is. Christina answered in the chat. Ah, thank you. <laughs> um, so it, it's gonna be um, 136, that's right, for any one of those possibilities, right? So any pair, whether it's a one and a one, a one and a two, the first one being a one, the second one being a two. That's right, these are all gonna be one out of 36. And the reason why is we can just take this product because we're told that these are independent. If we didn't know that they were independent, it wouldn't be that, that simple. We would have to know some more information. So for any value of y between one and six and any value of x between one and six, the probability that we get that combination of rules is gonna be one out of 36 for all 36 possibilities in this sample space, right? So we're treating one and then a two differently from getting a two and then a one. Although the product would come out to the same. Um, any any questions about how we got that formula set up? And okay, so then we need to start computing things. So one thing that we can do is we can pull out constant. So that one over 36, we can just pull that out from both of these sums since that doesn't depend on the value of x or on the value of y. Um, you guys can hear me, is that right? Okay, good. I have a slight delay here. Ah, there we go, okay. Um, so we can pull that 36 out. And so here we're gonna sum over X is equal to from one up to six. So there are different ways um, that we can think about doing this. One way I can think about doing this is saying, well, I would first plug in one for X, I get one times Y, then two times Y, then three times Y for five and six.
So at this point, once we've summed over the inside variable x, we should just have an expression that involves y, right? There shouldn't be any more x's. And so if I do my arithmetic here, what do we get? We get uh, 21, is that right? 21 y's. And then I can pull out that 21 since that's a constant. And then here I'm just adding 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. So I get um, another 21 out of this. which tells us the expected value of the product of that, of those two rules would be 12.25. And just recall that um, with these expected values, um, we're never gonna get a product of 12.25. The expected value is telling you on average, if you were to repeat this over and over and over again, on average, what would be the product that you get? Um, okay, so yeah, just a, a couple of last things that we can talk about um, next time since we're out of time here um, about how we can deal with um, finding expected values when things are independent versus not independent. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll jump into that next time. So um, I'll stop here. We'll kind of finish this up um, on Monday and then we'll move on to the next um, material, what's coming up next is I think we're just about done with the probability that we're going to need and we're ready to jump in statistics. Yeah, so the, um, yeah, we'll, we'll take a look at central limit theorem next time, which is really like the, um, we're not very creative in math. It's really central to um, everything that we're going to do in statistics. So um, yeah, I think we've got all of the probability tools that we need. And so next time we'll we'll start to um, apply these things to um, look at some experiments and some um, statistical models. Okay, well, um, you got your homework due on uh, Monday um, and I've got office hours tomorrow from 10.30 to 11.30 if anybody has questions. Um, otherwise, have a nice weekend if I don't see you um, and I'll, I'll see you guys on Monday.